Okay, so uh, welcome to the Vermont, Vermont Center on Behavior and Health lecture series. And um, we're in for a great one today with Dr. Ken Silverman. Um, just a, a quick housekeeping um, bit of business before we start. Um, so we are, we're going to hold questions uh, for Ken until the end of his lecture. Um, please send the questions through the Q&A link that you should see at the bottom of your screen or somewhere on the outlining of your screen. Um, and uh, Ken will do his best to, to answer them. So um, it's really my pleasure to have a chance to introduce Ken Silverman. He's a um, professor of psychiatry and behavioral science at the Johns Hopkins uh, University School of Medicine, where he directs the Center for Learning and Health. And um, Ken, without question, is simply one of the best clinical scientists in addictions research that I've had the pleasure to, to know. And um, as Ken and I were remarking to Nicole Tuig um, right before we got on here, I've had plenty of opportunity to get to know because um, I first met Ken uh, at the start of graduate school 42 years ago when he, as a second year student, was very kind and helped out myself and Warren Bickle, sec uh, first year students. And we've been close friends and, and colleagues ever since. Um, Ken's, Ken's um, had a terrific career. He's been continuously funded by NIH throughout his career, which we all know is not an easy thing to accomplish. He's won uh, national awards. He's, he's most known for his work on um, contingency management, the therapeutic workplace. But um, it, for those who have broader interests, I, I'd encourage you to check out uh, Ken on, on PubMed and you'll see that he's made important contributions in many different areas in addiction, starting with um, seminal work on the reinforcing effects of caffeine as a postdoc. And the study with Rowan Griffiths was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I think his work right now on um, the intersection of the related problems of poverty, chronic unemployment, and addiction is just uh, landmark work, and um, I'm sure he's going to be covering a lot of that today, and I can't wait to hear um, what he's up to, um, and I think the order in which Ken mentions those things, poverty, chronic unemployment, and addiction, gives you an insight into how he views the interrelationship of, the, of those problems, and he offers um, a terrific way to intervene on them simultaneously. So without any further delay, uh, please uh, listen carefully. And I know we can't welcome him in the traditional way. So Ken, please take it away. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Steve. It's great to be, uh, be here with you. Uh, I've been here a few times before, but of course, never from my, from my office at home. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'm going to talk about research that we've conducted over the years on the relation, use, use of operant conditioning to address poverty-related health disparities. A lot of people have contributed to this work over the years, uh, and they're listed here. Um, so poverty is related to a variety of adverse health conditions, uh, and a bunch of them are listed here. We focused our research, and I'm gonna focus this talk on HIV and drug addiction. So poverty uh, affects a lot of people in the United States, a little over 12% of people uh, live in poverty. And in Baltimore, where we conduct our research, 22%, uh, about 22% of people live in poverty. We've used uh, two different types of interventions uh, to address this problem. Proximal interventions that that uh, seek to promote health in people who live in poverty and distal interventions that uh, seek to reduce poverty. So first I'm gonna talk about some, a proximal intervention that we've developed and evaluated on the use of incentives to promote viral suppression in people living with HIV. So first of all, uh, it's very, very clear that poverty is related to HIV. 
this slide shows a percent of HIV diagnosis uh, increase as the percentage of people in a live li in a in an area live in poverty increases. Uh, so it's pretty clear uh, that poverty and HIV are related. Uh, now, antiretroviral medications are really amazing drugs. If someone who's living with HIV uh, takes antiretroviral medications every day, they decrease the amount of HIV in their body. And uh, this is, uh, they, and they, they, they decrease the amount of HIV in their blood, which is called viral load. So this is a graph of actual people. Oh, I forgot to. This is a graph of actual, a, a, real, a person in one of our studies who uh, with a viral load of that person over a year. And you can see this person was taking medication regularly and the viral load decreased over about eight weeks to a low level and it remained stable throughout that time. Uh, this dashed line is what's called the undetectable threshold. And the goal of antiretroviral medications is to decrease the viral load below uh, this threshold. Uh, now, if someone is taking antiretroviral med uh, medications regularly and decreases their viral load, it improves their health and uh, increases their lifespan. Uh, but one of the most amazing things about uh, these medications is that if someone takes antiretroviral medications regularly, achieves undetectable viral load, they they don't or they have a much less chance or don't uh, transmit HIV to other people, even if they do risky things. Mostly, uh, this is related to sexual transmission, and there's some evidence uh, that if um, we can get enough people to take antiretroviral medications regularly and decrease viral load in those people that we could end the end HIV epidemic. Uh, so in Baltimore, uh, this figure shows that about uh, half of the people, a little less than half of the people, a little more than half of the people have had undetectable viral load, uh, a little more than half of the people live with HIV have undetectable viral load, uh, which means that about half the people don't have undetectable viral load. Uh, so there's a lot of people who uh, uh, in, in Baltimore who are not taking antiretroviral medications regularly. Uh, a lot of different kinds of interventions have been eva evaluated to promote antiretroviral medication adherence. Uh, this, these are data from uh, meta-analysis and systematic review conducted by Cantor's uh, and, um, the, and, an eval and it, these are all different studies that, um, these are all different studies that, that sought to promote, have an inter evaluated intervention to promote viral, uh, antiretroviral medication adherence uh, in, the, in, the, in the participants. Uh, and 38 of those studies showed uh, used undetectable viral load as a measure in the study. And this shows data from those studies. So the different randomized control studies are re represented along uh, the x-axis. Uh, the vertical axis shows percent of participants with uh, undetectable viral load. And uh, each pair of points comes from a different study the solid point represents da data from the treatment group and uh, the, op the lighter shade po uh, point represents data from the control group. So you can see uh, most of these, almost all these studies produced non-significant effects, failed to show any treatment affected undetectable viral load and only two studies uh, affected uh, viral load. Now people have used incentives uh, to try and uh, promote um, antiretroviral medication adherence and undetectable viral load. And this is data from the studies that used undetectable viral load as a measure. Uh, and again, 
the group that the darker point is the group that, that received incentives for uh, adherence or viral suppression and uh, the open the lighter shade person group is the control group and you can see none of these produced any significant effect on undetectable viral load. We did a study which I'm going to tell you about in detail but here are the results from our study and you can see uh, there was a large effect uh, on undetectable viral load in that study and I'm, I'm going to tell you a little uh, detail about that study now. So that study used uh, people who were 18 years or older, they were living with uh, HIV, and they had detectable viral load at intake to the study. Uh, so we first gave those people HIV education, and then randomly assigned them to two groups, an incentive group or a usual care control group. Uh, the incentive group got the incentive intervention for uh, two years, and we collected data from both groups every three months for those two years and every six months after that. So I'm going to show you data for the first two years. Uh, we, we're, we're not quite, we're just about finished collecting data on the post-intervention effects, so I'm not going to show you anything on that yet. But this tells you a little bit about the uh, intervention, the incentive intervention that we used. Uh, we used a relatively a high magnitude incentive where people could earn $10 per day for having a decreased or undetectable viral load. We, uh, it takes a while uh, for someone who um, is taking medication regularly to have to achieve undetectable viral load is could take as many as eight weeks, sometimes more. Uh, so, so we reinforced initially decreases in viral load. Uh, of course, I didn't really know when I started this work uh, how much you know has to require for reinforcement. So, Bob Silicano uh, at Hopkins uh, is a real expert in this area, and I asked him, and he said. It should, viral load should decrease about 30% per week if someone's taken medication regularly. It turns out he was right. Uh, and we initially we tested uh, collected blood once every week, but, but with, then we quickly went to a random and decreasing viral load testing over the course of time. So uh, as long as someone maintained uh, decrease or undetectable viral load, we um, we increased the, the uh, decrease the frequency of the viral load testing by the end of uh, the two year period, people would be providing uh, blood samples once every 12 weeks on average. Uh, and we maintained the incentives for two years uh, and uh, people could earn $7,300 um, if they maintained, if they earned all the incentives over that two year period. And we applied uh, earnings to reloadable credit cards. Uh, we published this, the, the first year outcomes, which, I'm, which I'll talk to you a little bit about. Uh, and, uh, but I'm gonna tell you the second year outcomes, they're not published yet. But most, this is the description of the people. Most of the people were unemployed and living in poverty. We didn't select for that, but that's just what happened. Uh, so this slide shows viral load during the first year after random, random uh, assignment uh, for both groups. Uh, the dots represent individual pe people and the bars represent group means. So you can see there was a large sig statistically significant incre uh, increase in the percent of blood samples that were undetectable viral, that un undetectable viral load in the incentive group, 72% of the, the blood samples provided by people in this group were uh, had undetectable viral load versus 39% uh, in the control group. And that group, that, that, that difference was statistically significant. Uh, and this slide shows, we're working on this now, uh, the second year outcomes. Uh, and you can see the effect was pretty well maintained. 70% of the people in the incentive group had undetectable viral load compared to 44% of people uh, in the uh, usual care control. 
So this slide shows data over uh, two years, every three months for the two years. And you can see that the percentage of people in the incentive group with undetectable viral load was pretty stable uh, throughout the two year period uh, and always above uh, the usual care control. Uh, although there was a slight increase in undetectable viral load in the usual care control. Um, so that's it for, uh, for that study. Um, most of our work has been on uh, using operant conditioning or incentives to promote drug abstinence in people who live in poverty. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that work now. Uh, the drug use is not as clearly related to uh, poverty as HIV is, but, um, but a lot of our work is focused on injection drug users, and that is pretty clearly related uh, to poverty. This slide just shows that the percentage of people uh, uh, the, who, uh, uh, that injection drug use is related to poverty. Uh, people in the lowest income uh, have the highest rates of uh, injection drug use. So you, you, I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with abstinence reinforcement interventions. That's been the focus of a lot of our work. These are pretty simple uh, procedures uh, in which patients receive uh, uh, some kind of money or privileges contingent on providing objective evidence of drug abstinence. And our work focuses a lot on opiates of cocaine. And in that case, it's usually drug for urine. So people uh, get the privilege, uh, money or privileges for. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, voucher reinforcement, which, which uh, Steve developed and his colleagues uh, a long time ago. Uh, and under this voucher, uh, he, 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 his first work was using this voucher intervention to promote abstinence from cocaine. Uh, and uh, people got uh, monetary vouchers exchangeable for goods and services for providing uh, cocaine negative urine samples. Um, and uh, uh, that intervention has now been used by a lot of people. Uh, we did as well, although I'm not going to bore you with those studies. Uh, uh, but a lot of people have used this, uh, ver this ver voucher intervention or a variation of it. And it has proved to be one of the most effective treatments for drug addiction that has been available. Here are just some of the reviews. Uh, but, you know, the parameters of the uh, voucher intervention matter a lot. Uh, we know most about magnitude of reinforcement, and uh, as magnitude increases, uh, effectiveness increases. Uh, and uh, it's also the case that a lot of people relapse to drug use after the intervention is discontinued. This is some of the studies showing that. Uh, now, there are some studies that have detectable effects after the uh, abstinence reinforcement is discontinued, and that's important. But even in those cases, there's a general decrease uh, uh, over time uh, uh, since the abstinence reinforcement ended uh, in, in the percentage of people that maintain abstinence. So it's pretty clear that relapse is a problem. Uh, we have focused a lot on using abstinence reinforcement as a maintenance intervention, uh, and uh, uh, that seems to be pretty pretty uh, good good method. That if you promote pr uh, arrange long term exposure to abstinence reinforcement, uh, it maintains abstinence at least as long as the abstinence reinforcement is in effect. Um, so uh, we have, uh, as Steve mentioned, we've been developing this intervention called the therapeutic workplace uh, that has both proximal and distal, distal features of the intervention. Uh, the central feature of this therapeutic workplace is, is an abs employment-based abstinence reinforcement uh, contingency uh, in which people work uh, in our therapeutic workplace and earn wages but they were required to provide drug-free urine samples to maintain uh, either access to the workplace or access to the workplace and maximum pay or, ma or, or maximum pay. Um, we have focused our intervention on uh, 
poor, unemployed people who have few job skills. Uh, so for those people, we've maintained two phases of treatment, uh, a training phase uh, in which their job is to participate in intensive training. We initially provided vouchers for uh, as pay, but now we use reliable credit cards. Uh, once the people get abstinent and skilled in this phase, they move on to the second phase where they're where their job is to perform some real work, they get a paycheck, uh, just, and uh, conceivably this phase could be maintained indefinitely if people do work that's of value. So I'm not, I, I'm not gonna talk all that much, I've just tell, show, uh, talked about a, a few studies uh, uh, on the therapy at workplace. Um, this study show, was, um, Shall illustrate some of the main important features of the of this intervention. Uh, so we enrolled methadone patients, uh, of course, who are dependent on on uh, both opiates and cocaine, uh, and who also use cocaine. And um, they were enrolled in the first phase of the intervention for six months. And during this phase, pa patients had to provide. Uh, urine samples negative for opiates and cocaine to work and maintain maximum pay. People who got abstinent and skilled were then randomly assigned uh, to an employment only group or an abstinence contingent employment group. The employment only group was like was essentially they got they were they could work for a year in the in in the workplace, uh, but there were no longer any abstinence contingencies. This is similar to well, typical employment that people might get in the community, uh, although they were working in our in our workplace. Uh, and the absence contingent employment group, they um, could continue working, but they had to provide uh, urine samples negative for open so cocaine to uh, maintain access to the workplace and to maintain maximum maximum pay. Um, so this slide shows. Uh, uh, the percent of urine samples that were negative for cocaine uh, at monthly assessments from both groups. Um, and uh, you could see that about 80% of urine samples were negative for cocaine in the abstinence contingent employment group and, on, and uh, about 50% were negative for cocaine in the employment only group. And this, this was statistically significant. Um, it is, interestingly, they, the both groups worked about the same amount uh, during that year. Um, they worked about 600 hours on average, uh, but there was really no difference in how much they worked. So the key thing uh, was that this group had a lot of abstinence, uh, but it wasn't because of, the, of work, it was because of the abstinence contingency. So while work itself may be wholesome and you know, seem somewhat useful, uh, a lot of people continue to, to use uh, cocaine even while employed. And this slide shows data from before, every six months before, during, and after uh, this uh, abs empl employment-based abstinence contingency. So at the at enrollment into the study, both groups, hardly anyone was negative for opiates, for cocaine during, during this time at intake. At the end of six months, uh, when people had to provide, um, uh, had to be negative for cocaine to, to maintain access to the workplace, almost everybody from both groups was abstinent. But when they were uh, randomly assigned to the two groups, uh, this is similar to what I just showed you, about 50% of the people in the employment only group were negative for cocaine versus 80% uh, in, in the abstinence continuing employment group. But during the year after, uh, the, when the, when the absence, employment based absence reinforcement was discontinued and employment in the therapeutic workplace was discontinued, the two groups were similar. Uh, so uh, the truth is, I don't really know what could uh, maintain abstinence uh, during this time, uh, but I think probably employment based absence reinforcement could. Uh, so this slide just summarizes uh, studies that we've done on voucher incentives and employment-based incentives. Uh, and the darker points are the group that got the incentive intervention and the, the uh, lighter 
lighter shaded uh, is um, the, the control group. Uh, and overall, it just shows pretty clearly that uh, voucher and employment-based incentives are effective in promoting naltrexone, opiate abstinence, and cocaine abstinence. Uh, and uh, that, that, that's pretty true in a, in a, in a number of uh, different studies. So uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about employ employment. We've done something in this in this area, uh, but um, not that much. And uh, uh, but I'm going to tell you what we've done. So uh, we've developed three models of uh, of promoting abstinence and employment in the therapeutic workplace. Uh, in all three models, people get into the therapeutic workplace in phase one, uh, and then they uh, go to phase two. And we have a social business model, a cooperative employer model, and a wage supplement model. And uh, we have data on the social business model and the wage supplement model, so I'm going to talk about those, those two. Social business, uh, essentially, in hires, employs people in, in businesses that are designed in a social business, which are businesses designed uh, to uh, address the needs of people in poverty. And this kind of intervention could be arranged, uh, could be in, in, used in different kinds of businesses. Uh, we have, we used ours in, um, we made a data entry business called Hopkins Data Services. We trained people to become data entry operators and then hired them as data entry operators at Hopkins Data Services. Uh, this was actually the first study that we did uh, in uh, the therapeutic workplace. We took women from the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy who were receiving methadone treatment, uh, but continued to provide urine samples uh, po positive for opiates and cocaine. Uh, we randomly assigned those people to a usual care control group or to a therapeutic workplace group. Both groups were monitored over time. Uh, I'm going to show you some four, uh, up to four-year outcomes. Uh, usual care control was, it just received standard treatment from the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy, which was, when we did this study, it was pretty uh, comprehensive and intensive. Uh, and the therapeutic workplace people had the same intervention, but in addition, they were invited to attend the therapeutic workplace. Uh, they were in phase one uh, for three years. We actually could have done this a lot sooner, but we didn't have a business to move them into. And we, we opened the business uh, about four years, three years after, in, after people were in this study. And this slide just shows that the percent of urine samples negative for cocaine was pretty stable across the years. And, months one to six, 18 to 36, and 37 to 48. This is the period of time when people were uh, employed in the data entry business. And you can see uh, significantly more people, urine samples were negative for cocaine uh, during the, during, uh, stably across all these time points. And this just, just slow, shows the percent of months that people were employed full time uh, in in uh, during that fourth year after intake in the data entry business, um, uh, and about half of the people were were uh, employed full time. Uh, fairly often compared to the control group, um, it's interesting that the control group uh, hardly had any employment. So these are uh, at the start of the study were unemployed. Uh, pregnant or postpartum moms, uh, and uh, they were unemployed four years later. So they were going nowhere everywhere. The, whereas uh, people in the therapeutic workplace group, even though we provided the employment, um, were ready and willing to work uh, given the opportunity. So, so the next I'm gonna, last, last study I'm gonna talk about, uh, well, I think so, is, um, uh, evaluation of the weight supplement model. So in the weight supplement model, again, people start in phase one uh, uh, in which, which they get uh, their job to participate in training, and then they move to phase two. And in, 
and uh, get exposed to the wage supplement model, which I'll tell you more about in detail now. So in this study, people were exposed to, uh, invited to come to phase one of the therapy of workplace this time for three months. They had to provide urines negative for opiates or cocaine to um, uh, maintain their maximum pay. Uh, at three months, they were randomly assigned to people who were, were still, still uh, in the in attending were randomly assigned to a usual care control group or an absence contingent weight supplement group. Usually at care control, uh, both groups were given an employment specialist and offered an employment specialist for a year. Uh, and the employment specialist helped them get com uh, jobs in the community. They, uh, and the abstinence contingent weight supplement group, they got, uh, they, they um, got abstinence contingent weight supplements if they got employed. Uh, so they could earn wage supplements up to 8,000 an hour, um, up to 40 hours a week for, for maintaining employment in a community job. Um, and uh, they had to provide uh, valid verified pay stubs, uh, uh, which, 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 which we used to determine how many hours they work. Now, uh, <clears throat> because it takes some time for people to get, em get employment, they also earn stipends up to 20 hours a week uh, for working with the employment specialist. Uh, and, and you can see you know, almost 98%, almost all people were living in poverty. Um, and this slide shows the percentage of urine samples that are negative for opiates and cocaine in the usual care control and abstinence contingent weight supplement. Uh, group similar to things I've shown you before. Uh, people in the abstinence contingent weight supplement group had significantly higher rates of urine samples negative for opiates and cocaine than people in the usual care control group. Uh, and this slide shows something I haven't shown you, and that is the percentage of people who are employed uh, in a community job, the cumulative percentage. So you can see significantly more people 50 were employed in a community job in the absence contingent weight supplement group than in uh, usual care control. And by the end of the year, 59% had been employed, 59% uh, of the people in the absence of contingent weight supplement group were employed uh, versus 28% uh, in the usual care control. So th this was a pretty good outcome. Um, and this slide shows the percentage of people that ever lived in poverty, uh, the cumulative percentage. Uh, so you can see uh, that the percentage of people in the abstinence contingent weight supplement group, whoever lived out of poverty, I'm sorry, uh, was, was significantly higher than the percentage of people uh, in the usual care control group that ever lived out of poverty. So, uh, the 61 by the end of the study, end of this year, 61% of the people in the abstinence contingent weight supplement group ever lived out of poverty, compared to 30% uh, in the usual care control group. And this this was actually pretty pretty surprising and a pretty good outcome. Um, however. Uh, so yeah, we, we were happy about both of those outcomes, but there are two, but, but, it, but it's clear that, that this population needs a lot more work, uh, a lot more intervention than we provided. So this slide shows that uh, these, these are people in the abstinence continual weight supplement group, and it shows um, uh, that essentially they had part-time jobs and they didn't earn all that much money. Uh, per hour. So this slide shows that about uh, that, that people worked about when they were employed, which this this again is verified by wage sub, wage stubs. Uh, when they were employed, they worked an average of a little over 20 hours a week, uh, and they made about eleven dollars an hour uh, uh, on average, uh, which is okay, but uh, neither is great. So. Uh, I'm not sure how to improve those outcomes, um, but I suspect that 
some education focus intervention is is important and and at, at education focus the intervention that seeks to establish academic and job skills uh, so these are data from uh, that august halton uh, published a while back uh, of uh, the reading level of people in our different in in several of our studies uh, and it's based on the wide range achievement test which is an academic uh, standardized achievement test relatively easy to get to administer uh, the dots represent individual people again and the line horizontal lines represent group means and you can see people in these studies at an average reading level of about six between sixth and seventh grade uh, but some people had pretty pretty limited reading skills. Of course, some people were okay, but a lot of people had pretty, uh, pretty limited reading skills. And their math skills and spelling skills were similar, although I'm not showing you those. And about half of the people had not completed high school. Uh, so, uh, Whoops, I'm, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I'm getting a restart the program. No, I don't see it, Ken. All right, I'm gonna do it. Well, there's not much more to say. I'm gonna restart the program and see what happens. Sorry about that. What do you see? Is that is that showing it yet? Not yet. Uh, how about that? Can you see it now? Ooh, sorry, you need to go back into slideshow though, probably, because we can see your, your next slide. Uh. How about that? Still looks the same on our end. All right. Well, we can just see your next slide. And it, there's not much, that's not a big deal. I don't know how to fix it, so. Yeah, I mean, we can see the slides, so you could just finish. Yeah, that's, that's good. All right. Uh, well, sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened, but um, so uh, you know, people have used educate. Is this okay? I think so. I can see it fine. Sure. Good. 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 All right. People have used education focus intervention for people who live in poverty, uh, like people in welfare, and uh, those those interventions have not succeeded uh, well in part because they failed to retain people in the education programs. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about research that we've done, but we have a lot of work that shows that we are pretty good at retaining people in education. And uh, not surprisingly, we just using incentives is very effective. We can promote it, use incentives to promote attendance and training, to promote punctuality and complete workshops and uh, to promote, promote productivity and progress in training. Now, we haven't done all that much uh, uh, real education, uh, but we have, uh, we've done a little. Uh, and we've used, um, we've used this computerized math program called iLearn. Uh, it's used in high schools throughout the country. 
Uh, and um, this slide shows, uh, and it teaches, teaches math skills up through high school math. Uh, this showed, slide shows wide range achievement test scores for one group of people in one of our studies. Uh, and, it, and it shows the wide range achievement test uh, scores uh, before uh, people were, uh, before, you know, when people were enrolled in the study and then at the end, and those were pre-test scores. And then at the end, when they were, when they completed the study, those are post-test scores. Now it shows a wide range of achievement pre-test and post-test for both math reading, math spelling and reading. Uh, we only provided training in math. Uh, and you can see that uh, people increase significantly scores in the wide range achievement test uh, when they took when, on the math, math scores of the wide range achievement test, which was the only area that we provided training, but they didn't provide increase in spelling or reading, which are the areas that we did not provide training. So uh, that's, the, that's the little bit that we've done, uh, but I suspect that if we took this on more, you know, more seriously uh, and provided more comprehensive training uh, of academic and job skills that we could uh, improve their, uh, their skills to the point that they might be able to earn higher wages and and uh, get get uh, more stable uh, full time employment. Uh, that's, that's speculation, but uh, but I think that might be true. Uh, so there's uh, just a few simple conclusions to be drawn. Uh, one is that incentives at the therapeutic workplace can promote and maintain drug abstinence and medication here adherence. Uh, the therapeutic workplace uh, can promote employment and reduce poverty. And there's, uh, we have, we, we, we suspect that stipend supported education may be useful to promote employment in high paying jobs, but that's pretty much speculative at the moment uh, and uh, it deserves further work. Uh, so anyone, now or in the future uh, wants to email me for questions. My email is here. Uh, and Nicole asked me to include this as my last slide. And here it is. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but it's, I think that's it. All right. Thank you, Ken, for a really enlightening presentation. Um, you know, uh, I've been saying this for over 20 years, but your work, anytime I see it, just inspires me um, that there's so much more that could be done to people who are caught up in the dual problems of, um, of chronic unemployment, poverty, and addiction. And um, we often convey the impression that there's nothing that we know how to do for these populations. And yet you show for a modest wage, $10 an hour, you can get inner city, chronically addicted, chronically unemployed people to come to work and you can double absence rates. So you're, as a scientist, you're extremely humble, but um, your data actually just defy the current circumstances. And I've, I've noticed like with COVID, we've got an opportunity to see that often Policymakers ignore things, evidence-based practices that we could um, employ to improve health. And I think this is this is one. And I just want to point out for the audience, you mentioned it, and I just want to underscore it, that that one study in which you demonstrated um, doubling absence rates for several four years, I think, were in mothers of young children. So Though you know the 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 children of the mothers who were in the control group are just you know exposed to so much more disruption and, and and problems than would be necessary if there were policymakers would use your intervention and it could be scaled. I mean it's not that complicated. So I commend you for great work and I uh, I just think we have to push poly policymakers to do more. So please keep your uh, questions coming in. I'm going to turn them over to Ken now. The first question, Ken, was um, in the HIV study, 
did you um, try and parse out the contribution of education alone and, and incentives alone? You know, uh, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, one thing is, 82% uh, of the people were uh, living in poverty. And uh, we didn't select that, but, but generally it's hard to, there's, not, there's probably not that much variation. I didn't look at education uh, specifically, but uh, my guess is they look pretty similar to the populations that we've studied before. Uh, uh, so it's, yeah, it's, pretty, it's probably pretty hard to do it because uh, there's such high rate of uh, poverty and, and low levels of education. Okay, um, another question. Um, for, for employment program, I'm wondering if stress at work contributes to relapse and maybe some employment programs would work better than others if they minimize stress. Um, well, I'll tell you, the only thing, you know, the only thing that we do is arrange contingencies uh, for abstinence. And um, it seems to work pretty well. I mean, once people are employed, uh, they, if you maintain abstinence contingencies, they maintain abstinence pretty reliably. Uh, people go home to their regular lives and pretty, have pretty, pretty lousy lives. Uh, generally speaking, but the contingencies seem sufficient. Uh, uh, now, that's not to say that stress is irrelevant. Uh, it may, it, it may be, uh, it may be relevant, but uh, uh, we don't have that much control of that. And uh, contingencies are sufficient. I guess that's what, what I could say about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another question, a very interesting talk. I'm wondering if your research measured the long-term retention of those math skills obtained through incentive programs. Um, no, uh, no. I mean, yeah, math, math skills probably maintained pretty well, uh, but we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't measure that. Yeah. I mean, we actually have, a, we haven't done that much. I'm not too impressed with what we've done with, uh, education, uh, but uh, we're, we're actually, I have a grant, a grant uh, into the Institute for Education Sciences to do a randomized control study uh, with uh, that I learned math program. Um, and, uh, you know, it just, it, it requires a lot of work. And, uh, you know, I think that's an important question and we'll hopefully we'll learn more about that over time. Okay, so to the audience, there's still plenty of time for questions. Um, I'm going to ask one now because we don't have any in the queue here. Um, so Ken, you had shown early on the HIV work that um, others have tried incentives and they didn't work for HIV medication adherence or getting the viral load down to uh, be undetectable level. And um, and yet you could do it quite readily and quite convincingly. What do you think the difference is between those studies and yours? Yeah, that's an important question. Uh, and I can only make up the answer, but I think it, I think it might be true. I mean, we, we're not gonna know for sure unless we you know, do a study, a randomized control study. But uh, so one study, for example, uh, used incentives is a multi-site study by the Clinical Trials Network. Uh, and they used incentives for viral suppression. They also gave incentives for a bunch of other things. Uh, and the magnitude of incentive was very low. They used, so they, people could earn for viral suppression like $1 a day, uh, and it was delayed. So yeah. they, uh, had the, they had to the, they had the, uh, provide undetectable viral load like three or six months after, uh, whereas we provided high magnitude incentives we arranged the contingency in which they could earn incentives after a week by having decreased, uh, you know, a decreased viral viral load, uh, and so they could earn a week, uh, incentives every week. Right. Uh, and the duration only the, the inter testing interval only increased if they essentially initiate, you know, had, uh, met the criteria. Uh, so. Uh, I think what well, I think we just used 
uh, you know, good parameters for reinforcement that anyone would, you know, know if they looked at uh, reinforcement parameters and probably weren't too concerned about, uh, uh, you know, what people thought. So uh, it, it reminds me of that time you and I were invited to give input to an international group, but mostly U.S. investigators who were yeah. um, who were putting together various initiatives to suppress viral load, um, HIV viral load in Africa. And they shared the incentive value that they were gonna use. And I remember you standing up and saying, that's ridiculous, that, that incentive magnitude is way too low. And yet they ran the study. And I don't know if it was a year or two later, we had, had the opportunity to see in big headlines, incentives don't work in the New York Times, I think it was. <laughs> so, yeah. It turns, it turns, yeah, that, that, that is exactly right, uh, including the part where I was not too diplomatic. Well, you but, sure um, did. <laughs> but, um, but uh, uh, that actually is a, that, uh, that meeting event was the thing that got me interested in this. Right. Uh, and it turned out they gave, Seventy dollars uh, if someone had undetectable viral load at three months, and I think what I said at that meeting was I wouldn't turn a light switch on. I don't think you can get people to turn a light switch on and off every day for that amount of money, and uh, <laughs> that was terrible. But, <laughs> but uh, the sad part but, is but yeah. terrible, but true. But anyway, it turned out they actually uh, they published those data. I have never been able, I've, we, we, we've tried repeatedly to try to get the actual data. They don't show the data, but they had like 16,000 people. This was a, also a multi-site study uh, in the HIV Prevention Trials Network. Um, and uh, they had a 3% increase in undetectable viral load. Uh, which with 16,000 people ended up being significant. I think when we, when they first present the data, which, which I think what you're remembering uh, is, it was not significant, but apparently they got some way to show that it was, uh, but it was pretty small. Uh, and I don't really know, I never got the actual data to know what, pe what people, what the, what the increase was from and to, mm -hmm. but it was very, very small. Another question here, what's the next step after the HIV study showing the effect of high magnitude incentives on viral suppression? Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, well, first of all, we're, we're gonna look to see whether the, they maintain uh, in the year afterwards. Uh, and, you know, they, 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 I, I took a little peek at some of the data, which we, we were, we don't have all the data and I think there might be some maintenance in the first six months, uh, but not necessarily in the second six months. So if, if they don't maintain what I think uh, is useful, um, is a re and we have some data to suggest that a low magnitude incentive may be effective at maintaining abstinence, but not initiating it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have some data from a study that we published in 2004 on cocaine abstinence, which I won't go through in detail, but I can just tell you, it provides some reason to think that a low magnitude incentive may be good as a maintenance intervention. So what I think might be a useful thing is to get, is to increase, use a high magnitude incentive like $10 a day for a short period of time, let's say six months, to get people uh, taking medication regularly and have undetectable viral load, and then switch to a lower magnitude reinforcement as a maintenance intervention. And that might make it uh, more palatable to people. Um, so I think that is probably uh, the next, an, another choice. I mean, I, I have thought about doing the therapeutic workplace because it turns out poverty is really very clearly related to HIV. And it turns out it's even related to uh, viral suppression. There was another publication recently that, from the CDC uh, that followed up on the thing that I presented, uh, included in this presentation. I just got it the other day. Uh, and it's pretty clear that, that, that the HIV um, 
is related to poverty and viral suppression is related to poverty. So maybe this, this uh, therapeutic workplace intervention with weighed, weighed supplements say, uh, might, be sufficient, might be effective in uh, promoting employment and reducing population, poverty in that population. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think either of those two things, or maybe a combination of them, a lower uh, reinforcement to, uh, to maintain uh, viral suppression over time, uh, and, um, and, and the therapeutic workplace to reduce poverty. Uh, it turns out, I didn't present these results, but the, these, these are not published yet, but um, Research Triangle Institute has worked with us. Uh, we, we subcontracted with them to do a uh, cost effectiveness analysis. Uh, and their analysis shows that uh, even with this magnitude, uh, it's cost effective. I mean, it turns, it turns out, you know, these medications, antiretroviral medications are incredibly expensive. Uh, and uh, or they're not that expensive to the, to the participants, but they're expensive to society. Uh, they could cost, uh, I think, twelve to $15,000 a year. Um, and it turns out that people in the usual care control group who are also in medical care, they get their prescriptions filled. They just don't take them. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it, that, that problem is probably not that hard to show uh, that it can be cost effective under those circumstances. Right, right. I think especially when you mentioned that if you could get um, improve adherence substantially, you could potentially eliminate the uh, spread of HIV. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. But you, but I think that I think that there there's there's good reason to think that that's the case. If you have enough suppression in enough people, you can uh, eliminate the epidemic. Yeah, which is an amazing thing to think about. Um, okay, so a question, uh, just wondering if you have any ideas about the um, increasing trend in the control group across time in the um, uh, proportion with undetectable viral load? Yep, um, not really. I mean, you know, um, one thing is uh, there in medical care uh, yeah. and the, the clinics, the medical clinics really work hard uh, to get people to uh, take medications regularly. So, I mean, it's actually so surprising under those circumstances that people don't take the medication uh, so yeah. that they creep up over time uh, is not that, not that surprising. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't really know what's happened and why they why that's happened. Yeah, I mean I've seen that myself in some of our studies. And the way I think about it is, it's uh, there are naturalistic contingencies that can also increase adherence, but sometimes they're much less palatable than um, incentives. So, yeah. for example, you yeah. find out you, you've infected, you, you know, your spouse, or you've infected some other people, or yeah. you've gotten sick, or whatever. Uh, so there are naturalistic contingencies that can drive adherence, but often they're, they're um, pretty unpalatable. Yep, yep. Um, so uh, maybe one final question. Um, I understand you measured the number of days worked and the average hours worked, but did you look at the difference in the quality of work between the absence contingent and control groups? Um. Let's see, in our studies, I'm not sure which study you're talking about, but uh, in our studies um, where we have pretty detailed measure of work, uh, I mean, it turns out to be relatively trivial. It's either like typing or math. Uh, uh, although we have, we have done data entry, it, it's pretty tough to detect differences in performance as a result, you know, between uh, groups that take drugs, that use drugs on their own and groups that don't. Uh, so it, it's, it's pretty difficult. We did see some effect in one study, but uh, it's not dramatic. So I don't think, uh, you know, you could see in that one study that people work the same number of hours uh, independent of whether they got abstinence contingencies. 
Uh, and we, 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 we frequently, we have looked at different studies to see if their performance is different and it's very difficult to see any effect uh, on performance. Okay, and I'm now going to try the journalist. That was going to be my last question, but yeah. <laughs> just brief answers. There's two questions here outstanding and, and that I'd like to um, run by you if you can answer quickly. First okay. one's maybe not easy to answer quickly, but how can we increase acceptance of incentives as an intervention? Well, I'll ask them both. So that's number one. And are there people who take the anti-retrovirals and yet don't achieve um, undetectable viral loads? Uh, it, well, in answer to the first one, I don't know. <laughs> so how about that? That's quick for you. I could make up some stuff, but we don't have time for my nonsense. Uh, and um, the other one is whether people take medication and don't have anti. I think that might be true. I think it's probably pretty rare. Some people do develop um, resistance and medicate, you know, physicians know that and they change the medication. There are a bunch of different medications that are available. Uh, so that's probably, that, uh, that doesn't account for the outcomes that we got, but um, uh, we, we, we actually see similar effects on self-report of medication adherence, but, but I think it's possible. I'm not, I think it's uncommon. Okay, Ken. So thanks again for a wonderful presentation. Uh, thanks to the audience for, for being with us and for the terrific questions and participation. And that wraps up our session for today. All righty. Thank you.